and get started here. Good evening, everybody, and welcome wherever you are joining us from. Uh, I'm the Reverend Julia Hamilton. I'm the lead minister at the Unitarian Society of Santa Barbara, and it is my great delight to be joined this evening by uh, with Dr. Rebecca Fielding Miller. Um, and to talk a little bit about the current situation, uh, particularly as it pertains to families and kids. Uh, what do we need to know? Uh, what are the questions that we have um, as we navigate this world? I know one of the things that is so challenging is we're all being asked to make decisions every day. You know, we're sort of overloaded with all of these micro decisions from how do we grocery shop to who do we see to uh, how do we use a mask effectively. Um, and so our brains are, can just be kind of swamped uh, and feel like overwhelmed by all of the decisions that we're um, being asked to make. And so this is one of the reasons why I'm so grateful for people like Becca uh, to help us navigate some of these decisions, to have good solid data um, and help relieve some of that decision fatigue that I know I feel. Um, and maybe hopefully one of our goals is to walk away from this evening having relieved some of that decision fatigue uh, and let you feel like you have some good solid information to base your daily uh, decision making processes on. Um, I want to introduce Rebecca a little bit, let you know who we're talking to. Dr. Fielding Miller is an assistant professor at the University of California, San Diego in the Division of Infectious Disease and Global Public Health and the Center on Gender Equity and Health. She previously focused her work on structural drivers of HIV and gender-based violence in the United States and Sub-Saharan Africa with a focus on the intersection of race, gender, and economic inequality. There's um, a lot of commas in all of the titles and descriptions of your work, Becca. That's how um, we do. However, I'm sorry. Like, it's great. Uh, you've done so many wonderful things in the field of public health across the world. And like so many folks um, in your field, now you have turned your attention to the COVID-19 crisis. And most recently, I was also um, thrilled to see your work featured on CNN when you were talking about the risk to farm workers. You know, here on the Central Coast, um, we have deep ties to agriculture and so really appreciative of people like you who are paying attention to what the risks are for the agricultural workers out in the fields. Um, you, hold, you hold a degree in international health, social and behavioral interventions from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and a PhD in behavioral sciences and health education from Emory University. You served in the Peace Corps in South Africa and you as a Fulbright Scholar in Swaziland in 2013, 2013 and 2014. And you have ties here to Santa Barbara. And one of the wonderful ways that I know uh, Becca is because I had the great privilege of officiating at her wedding here at the Unitarian Society several years ago. And it's been a joy to see your daughter uh, also come into the picture over the past few years. Um, and I appreciate the way you pay attention to the intersectionality of all of these questions. So feel free to ask questions about how social justice um, and the COVID-19 crisis intersect, because I know that that's a passion of yours as well. So again, I'm sure there's a lot of other wonderful things that we could say by way of introduction, but welcome to the conversation here uh, in Santa Barbara. Welcome to everyone who's joining us in this webinar, um, wherever you may be and just get your questions ready. Um, we did have you record a little video for um, a project we were doing this summer. And so unless there's anything you'd like to stay, say, we can, we can play this video and it'll give people a little bit of a snapshot of, of some of your work to date. Anything you'd like to chime in before we hit play? No, I just, I'm super happy to be here and be talking with everybody today. Um, yeah, like I said, I was, I was born in Santa Barbara. It was such an honor and privilege to get married right at USSB. Um, and someday, someday when we can travel again, we, I cannot wait for Esther to stop by and say hello in person. It would be marvelous. <laughs> All right, so go ahead, um, Christine, if you wanna share the video. And I'm gonna turn off the chat function at this time and um, hold those questions. And then you can ask those questions using the Q&A button. But right now I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the chat while we uh, watch this introductory video. So today I want to share a little bit with you about not just the biology behind COVID-19, but the social epidemiology. So who is getting sick with COVID-19 and why? So COVID-19, I'm sure we all know, um, 
began in somewhere between November and January in China, and it rapidly spread throughout the world. This is the number of cases per million people as of February 1st, 2020. This is March 1st, April 1st, May 1st. And this is as of last week, June 19th, 2020. And you can see that recently, the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic is very much in the United States. For a number of weeks, New York City was the epicenter of the outbreak, and now it's beginning to move throughout rural areas. But you can see there's no part in the world that isn't really affected, except for New Zealand, which has done a tremendous job. Um, but it's really in America that we're being the hardest hit. So this is what COVID-19 looks like in the U.S. Um, these shades are in order of magnitude. So each time the red is a little bit darker, that means 10 times more people have died. And you can see that New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, these big cities, Denver, these are the places where um, people are have been dying the most. These are the areas that have been the most affected. But you can also see this interesting phenomenon where, for example, if you look over here at the Four Corners area, this is the Navajo Nation. And the Navajo Nation has extremely high case rates and an extremely high number of people who have passed away of COVID-19. You can also see some um, bright dots out in areas you wouldn't expect, and those tend to be things like meatpacking facilities or um, a funeral, actually, is what happened here in, um, in southeast Georgia, or southwest Georgia. So the big cities are the epicenters, but there are some social factors that are putting people at risk in other places. You can see Detroit um, has quite a big outbreak right here, and that has a lot to do with inequality and poverty. So some of the best ways that we can protect ourselves from getting sick are by washing our hands a lot, staying at least six feet away from other people, um, being outside if we are going to be around other people who we don't live with, um, wearing a mask to protect other people from our respiratory droplets, and staying home if we don't feel well, um, because that will keep us from infecting other people. But the problem is, not everybody has the ability to do all these things. So this is a list that is making the rounds of the internet. Um, I don't know that I agree with all of this, but I think it's a pretty reasonable starting place. And this is just one way to think about what things can we do, what is, what is the risk level of different activities that we want to do every day. So for example, getting takeout at a restaurant where you order it in advance um, or over the phone, you go inside wearing your mask, you pick up the bag, and you bring it back home again, probably pretty safe. Um, camping where you go, you're outside, you set up your own tent, um, especially if you're not sharing a bathroom with a lot of other people who are out camping, probably reasonable. Um, going for a walk or a bike ride with other people, especially if you stay six feet away, pretty reasonable. Um, going to a bar is not a great idea because they're crowded, people talk really loud, um, and when we drink, we tend to get a little bit um, forgetful and sloppy. <laughs> That's how we can keep ourselves safe. Similarly, gyms are enclosed spaces where a lot of people are breathing heavily and not wearing masks, so they're not very safe places to go. But, you know, there's another way we can think about this. These are risk um, factors for you as an individual, but there are other people involved in each of these, not just you getting your takeout or going um, to the gym. So, for example, when you get takeout or when you go to a restaurant, there's the people who are making your food and serving your food. When you decide that um, you're going to be really careful and you're going to take Lyft or a taxi, there's the person who's driving you. There are the home health aides and the people who work in healthcare settings who are um, helping folks who are providing support to doctors and nurses. And there's the custodial staff who are keeping things clean in hospitals, in hotels, in office settings, everywhere that we go. And these people have very different risk factors. So the people in a kitchen are at much higher risk um, of getting COVID-19 than you when you walk in to get your delicious takeout. While it, the individual risk to you might be pretty low if you take Lyft once, the driver is coming into contact with lots and lots of people in an enclosed space every day. Similarly, your risk of um, taking an airplane might be individually mm, medium, but for the flight attendants who are coming into contact with lots and lots of passengers every day, their risk is probably pretty high. 
And so I think we can't just think about individual risk, we have to think about the risk of an activity to everybody. And you know what's really important to think about is a lot of these jobs that are high risk are also jobs that are really low pay. So I really like this graph because it looks at this x-axis here down at the bottom is kind of a guess at how risky these different jobs are. And the y-axis um, is how much those jobs get paid. So you can see down in the bottom right, there are jobs that are low pay and high risk, and that's things like nursing assistants and orderlies and paramedics and home health aides, childcare workers, bus drivers, flight attendants. And you can see in the, in the top left, those are jobs that are low risk and high pay. So if you're a CEO who can work from home or you're a lawyer who can work from home, you're a fancy professor who can work from home, these are all high pay and low risk. And I think it's really important that we notice that a lot of these essential worker jobs are very low paying jobs. In grocery stores or in pharmacies, people who are cashiers, people who are wait staff. And the vast majority of these jobs, um, people who work at these jobs are people of color and especially women of color. And so what that does is that means that the people who are at the highest risk of getting sick are are also women of color and people of color. So this is data from New York where we can see that people who are Hispanic or Latino or African American have significantly higher rates of mortality than people who are white or Asian. And this is data from Northern California where we're seeing the same, that in San Francisco County, um, Latinos, um, black folks are at significantly higher risk of, um, of both contracting COVID-19 and of dying. And that's not a coincidence, right? So this is our map again. So think again about where we're seeing people getting sick. And we can see that this pattern of what we call health disparities, racial health disparities, is happening across the United States. Pretty much everywhere in the US, there's a disproportionate amount of African Americans, minorities, people who are living in poverty, are disproportionately getting sick and are disproportionately getting dying. And I would say that in Arizona, there on the left, the only reason that that little box is kind of bluish gray for Arizona is because the health disparities are largely in the Navajo Nation as opposed to um, among African Americans, which is where this um, graph is, is measuring in particular. So there's just a, a little snapshot of some of the work you've been doing. Is there anything that um, we should know? You know, that was made in mid-June, and obviously now a month and a half has gone by. Is there anything that jumps out at you that you would want to update from that video? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's it's clear now that a lot of the conversation and a lot of concerns are certainly focused on school and how do we open schools again. Um, I think that this is definitely a place where we need to start thinking again about issues of, of equity and justice and who's going to have access to a, a safe and enriching school experience and who's not. Um, I also think it's important to point out that it has become increasingly clear in the last few weeks and months that, um, that ventilation um, is more and more, the more we learn about it, the more important it is. So, Washing your hands is really important, but even more important is um, thinking about the airflow and the space you're in and outside is always better than inside and, and so on. So I would have emphasized that more if I made this video now, but the broad strokes are definitely sadly still about the same. So the basic idea for this evening now is to go straight into a conversation um, that's generated by the questions from you, uh, from what's uppermost in your mind. Um, and we have two questions that we wanted to start off with, but we asked uh, one of the kids in our community um, to what was on his mind, and he made a little video asking you some questions to begin with. So um, Christine, if you want to go ahead and share what Dylan's questions were, and we'll get us started that way. We'll get that going in just a second. There we go. So um, my question was, what has more cases, Europe or um, the USA? Because I remember uh, like around like I think April, 
um, Italy was like really, really bad. Yeah, so that's a good question. You know, I, Dylan, I was writing a grant today and failed to look up the exact numbers for you, and I'm sorry, but I can tell you that um, right now the U.S. definitely has more cases. So in the beginning in February and March, when we first started seeing this, like you guys saw in those graphs, um, we kind of watched the epidemic travel from China, from Wuhan, um, and out, and so through Italy, um, for a while, Italy, Iran, um, China were really areas that we were very worried about. Um, and as time went on, um, those countries implemented really um, strict social distancing and, and lockdown policies. Um, and the US was not quite as quick on those measures. And so um, in recent weeks and months, cases have really declined quite a lot in Italy and the rest of Europe. Um, as they have continued to, in some places, plateau or really climb still in the U.S. So right now, the U.S. actually has the most cases um, in, of any country in the world. Um, and Italy, I think, is just now, um, or maybe just last month, thinking about um, opening up again. Um, I think people in Italy were really uh, worried about what happened, and they're trying to be really conservative now. So do you know, for example, if Italy has been under a, a basically a stay at home um, situation since February have, or have they have they kind of stepped on the gas and stepped off the gas at all? Or have they basically just kind of said, OK, everybody just hunker down and we're going to get through this? That is such a good question. And I don't actually know the answer to that. <laughs> and that's okay. We're you know, all about not knowing things. <laughs> you know, I would tell you if I if I knew, um, you know, I think. I, you know, the last time I looked at Italy's data, oh, thank you, Yolanda. Um, Yolanda put some, put some actual information in the chat box, and I appreciate that. The last time I looked at Italy's data, they were kind of just starting to think about reopening, and it was, um, they were just starting to think about making some of the choices we're making now. That was in, um, I want to say, early July, and they were down to certainly cases in, in the dozens. Um, per day, not tens of thousands. So uh, Yolanda filled in in our uh, question and answer box, which I don't think everybody can see, that the Italy coronavirus cases to date are 249,204. And so far they've had about 35,000 deaths in total, um, which as you know, if you know over the current um, deaths in the United States is far, far below where we are at. Um, uh, we have a second question from Dylan, and then we're going to go ahead and get to some of the questions that you've started to type into the Q&A box. I was thinking um, that maybe I could, we could do like a camping trip in his backyard, in my friend's backyard, and we both sleep in different tents. So that would work. That's such a good question. And I think that's the kind of question that we're all trying to figure out right now. It's so hard. We've been doing this since March, right? And we want to see our friends and we're all trying to figure out what is a safe way to actually spend time with my friends. So in general, um, outside is always better than inside. Um, further apart is always better than closer physically. Um, and wearing a mask is always better than not wearing a mask. So that's what kind of guides me when I think about whether or not something is safe. Um, I feel, I personally, I feel pretty good about visiting with friends in, in a backyard or in a park with everybody wearing masks, especially if we're staying far apart. You know, I think the thing about a sleepover is gosh, it's always really tempting to want to like share snacks or maybe I'll just sneak into your tent for a second or something. It's, you know, we're all people and it's so, you can't, it's hard to be perfect. I've never met a perfect person in my life. Um, and so there's always that moment where you think, oh, well, what if I, I just want to ask my friend a quick question. Let me just like sneak into his tent real quick, just for a minute, it'll be fine. And then you're in a confined space with another person or, you know, you need to use the bathroom because also we're all people. And then now you're in a confined space in somebody else's home. So 
I think visiting with friends outside is great. I think maybe sleepovers I'd be a little bit nervous about, which is a real bummer. Um, but at least there are ways that we can spend time together in person um, that reduce some of that risk. So one of the things I'm hearing you say is it's not just knowing the external risk factors, it's also knowing your own self-control ability yeah. <laughs> and how well you will be able to resist those little temptations, those little kind of slips of, oh, it'll be fine if I just, you know, um, grab a piece of cheese from that shared plate or run into the bathroom real quick um, or give somebody a hug. You know, those are the things that our human heart wants yeah. to do and we have to know our own capacity not just the risk factor like the objective risk factor but our own subjective capacity to live um, with self-control in those situations which is really hard yeah and gosh you know i don't even know that i would think of it as temptations i would think of it as those are really normal things to do um, it's really normal to want to give your friend a hug it's really normal i hate it when people come to my house and i can't feed them oh I cannot imagine inviting people over and not offering them food. It just makes me so frustrated. Um, and and I, I don't even know that I think of it as temptation so much as habit or really some of the best parts of who we are, we have to avoid. So yeah, it's really hard. So we have a question from Yolanda. Um, if your windows are down in the car with a friend not in your pod, do you need a mask? And so I think she's saying that some of us have sort of a quarantine pod, maybe one mm -hmm. or two other people that we've formed a bubble with, but is what is the risk and do you need a mask if you're in a car with the windows down? Mm -hmm. So the other thing that I think about when I try and make these decisions is the sort of risk benefit or the cost of um, doing a certain thing to protect myself. So if I'm sitting in a car with a friend and the windows are down, that's reasonable, but also it's not that hard to put a mask on. Like it's not, you know, maybe our first instinct right now, but I think it's so um, relatively simple to put a mask on uh, and the consequence, the possible consequence is so not ideal that, you know, why not just wear a mask? Um, it's better. Another question we have um, is from Kanta, how accurate are the COVID-19 tests right now? I have heard that they are only 30% accurate. That is a really good question. So right now there are kind of two main tests that people think about. Um, there's, you might've heard like the antibody or the serology test, um, and that looks to see if you have potentially gotten COVID-19 at some point in the past. And that one is, fine, but there's a lot of things it can't tell you. It can't tell you if you have it right now. It can't tell you the degree to which you were sick. Um, so if you actually had, if you actually got sick enough that your body could mount a full immune defense, or if your immune system was just kind of like mildly irritated enough that there's antibodies there, but you don't have any immunity. So I, I worry about those tests. I don't even know how to quantify accuracy. Um, for the, the diagnostic tests, which are the, the nasal swabs, some of them just kind of go up to here and some of them feel like they go all the way up to here. Those are, um, if you test positive, you can be really, really sure that you're positive. Um, so what those do is they look for um, little bits of the virus and then they replicate it out a whole bunch. Um, so we're pretty sure that if it's there, it's definitely there. The tricky part is um, knowing how confident to be in a negative test result. So we know that you are most, if you've been exposed and you actually caught the virus, you are most likely to test positive about five to eight days after that exposure. That's when there's enough virus in your system for that test to catch or in your um, nasal passages. Um, so it's entirely possible that you got exposed five minutes ago on the way to the test site um, and that wouldn't show up. Um, we also know that even within that five to eight day window, it's not perfect. So there is still a risk of, um, of getting a false negative. And some of that depends on some surprisingly counterintuitive math. Um, but it's always good to get a test and to have a sense of your status. But sadly, it's still always best to ask to act with a little bit of caution because it would be such a shame to know that somebody else got sick because even though you thought you were doing a good job, the test was just not 100% perfect. 
All right. Um, so what I'm hearing you say is that with the antibodies test, even if you test that you have the antibodies, there's no guarantee that that connects to immunity. That you could have antibodies from a very light, mild case and not have built up enough to actually be immune um, to, the, to the disease. Is that correct? Yeah, sadly, yes. And there's also some possibility. So there's about five types of coronavirus that circulate. Four of them cause a cold. Um, and it's also not clear. It's possible that the antibody test could also be picking up on a cold that you had in the last year. So it's not clear how much immunity you have, and it's not 100% that the test is actually responding to COVID-19. There was a really great piece actually in The Atlantic this morning um, by Ed Young, who's been doing really great reporting on this that kind of goes through how ridiculously complicated all the immunology and science is behind am I immune or am I not? It's just mind-bogglingly complex. So, so here's a, a kind of follow-up question that somebody submitted. Can you get the coronavirus a second time? Do we know? We that? don't know. <laughs> probably not. Certainly, probably not within a year. Um, this piece I just mentioned this, um, that came out this morning actually touches on this. So there have been some anecdotal cases of people testing positive and then months and months later testing positive again. It's kind of unclear if that is a result of testing error at some point or another. Um, if it's because virus pieces just hang around for a really long time and that doesn't necessarily mean you're infectious. Um, or if somebody did get it twice. Um, those reports have been really rare, which does suggest that um, at the very least it's not a major concern. Um, but we don't know. We know that normal coronavirus immunity, so like the kind that cause a cold, maybe lasts for a year, four to five years. Um, the odds are that it will happen to at least one person. And <laughs> but it's, I don't think it's a huge chance. So after uh, another question, if you've tested positive and you quarantine for 10 to 14 days, uh, is it a good idea to be retested again? Yeah, so I think like I said, um, sometimes we're not quite sure how long the virus sticks around. Um, and I know I've talked to friends who find that really frustrating. Like at what point am I, at what point am I not going to put other people I care about at risk? And I think the best person you should have that conversation with is your doctor. Um, I know that if you have not, I think we usually look for no symptoms for 14 days. Um, but honestly, I think that's a bit of an unknown. But I know a negative test is probably a pretty good sign. You want that. So this is a question about what I uh, know is one of your most exciting um, things to talk about. Uh, and anybody who has a young child at home probably talks about this topic a lot in general, which is poop and poop testing and what tell talk to us the question is talk about the value of poop testing especially in schools how is it done um, does it take sophisticated and expensive equipment and and why should we talk about poop testing yeah so um poop is close to my heart as a return peace corps volunteer and also the mother of a three-year-old she'll be three next month oh my gosh um so you might have noticed recently as cases really spiked across the state that it became really difficult to get a test. So there were supply chain issues with individual testing. Um, we've also seen that there can be really long turnarounds sometimes for um, getting your test results. So if you get um, exposed on a Friday and you can't get a test until 10 days later and you don't get your test results back for two weeks, that's not super useful. So we need backup systems. And one really interesting backup system is called um, wastewater, uh, wastewater epidemiology, wastewater surveillance, although public health uses the word surveillance um, a lot. And I know that word makes people nervous, so we're trying to think of new words. Um, so COVID-19 actually also sheds in fecal matter. There's virus in poop. And so one of the things you can do is actually monitor 
um, at um, wastewater treatment plants or even in individual sewers, um, you, you can look and see if there's any virus in wastewater. And that can give you a sense of how, how a community or an area as a whole is doing. So this has been done in um, Europe. There was a team that did it at Schiphol Airport um, and could actually monitor people going through the airport. There's a team at Yale that's shown that doing this at the community level can actually give you a sense of community outbreaks two or three days before individual testing can. So it seems like a really great tool to get a sense of what's going on in um, a fairly broad group, um, a, a group of people who are sharing a wastewater pool that you can sample. Um, so one of the things we've been talking about in San Diego County is the possibility of using this as an early alert system for schools. So what if we could um, um, keep an eye on what's coming out of schools? Um, I think you could even probably time it to recess to like ca catch like different ages. Um, and that would give you kind of a constant sense of are there cases in the school? Um, and if yes, then we need to go in and, and do a lot of individual testing because we know that the degree of individual level testing we'd have to do to really, really know what's going on with everybody in school is um, sadly probably not feasible. You'd have to give, everybody would need to test like once a week, twice a week to um, catch anything before there's an outbreak. So wastewater surveillance is a cool potential redundancy. Um, and there are, we know a lot of communities, especially in Southern California, that have a lot of concerns about um, what government officials, even friendly public health government officials might be doing with their data when they go to test. Um, you have to provide a driver's license if you want a test from the county or the state, which is certainly a barrier for a lot of folks. Um, and if you test positive, then a case investigator calls you up and says, I need you to tell me everybody you've been with for more than 15 minutes in the last 14 days so that I can let them know. But we know that people who have undocumented friends or household members or who are undocumented themselves, if they do manage to get a test, they're going to be really nervous about that process um, and about who else might have access to that information. So we know that certain communities that are already at high risk might have extra worries about what an individual test might imply. So I also think it's really important to have backup systems to make sure that those communities, um, we also know what's going on there. And if it seems like there's an issue, then we can go in and make sure that there's sort of the longer, more trust building community engaged process of making sure people are taken care of and safe. So it sounds like this is one of those um, places that in the United States we've come to a sticking point where the collective health of a community hasn't really been, at least as far as I've seen, hasn't really been focused on nearly as much as the individual health. You know, how do you test a person to see mm -hmm. if they're sick has kind of dominated the conversation and not nearly so much thinking about how do you keep your finger on the overall health of a community. So it sounds like this fecal testing or poop testing is a way to flag it early on to see if you need to drill down to the individual level. Um, but we would have to have a collective sense of responsibility around it because it's not it's not a one on one kind of um, situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm going to pick up a couple more questions here. Um, one of the questions that came up sort of dovetailing on that um, perhaps lack of interest in dealing with the pandemic, as the questioner asked, uh, and the assumption that the infections will continue to burn the country for some time. How long do you think it will be before we can go back to church, let alone sing in the choir? Yeah. You know what really bums me out is, is that singing is a risk factor. How sad is that? Because when you, when you sing, you project your breath and you project virus. So, in that video I talked about, um, there was an outbreak associated with a funeral in Southwest Georgia. And we've seen several outbreaks associated with, um, with funerals. There was actually a sort of a case study associated with a choir practice in Washington state. And so we know that singing indoors sadly is a particularly bad idea. Um, so I think we will go back to some form of church I think choir is going to be one of the last things that comes back, which is just such a bummer. Um, but handbell choir, 
this is your moment. <laughs> yeah, if anybody's been wanting to start at the handle choir, come and talk to me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the thing about church is the way we have traditionally done it, it's inside. Um, there's a lot of shaking hands, hugging people, being in close proximity to one another. Um, and all the ways that we have traditionally thought about a church service come with a lot of safety risks. Um, one of the w things that we're trying to make sure that we think about in San Diego as we think about reopening is not only what is the risk to our individual community, church community, but what happens when 25 people or 80 people from all over the county come together, they spend time with one another, and it just happens and 20 of them go home with the virus. It's not just the 20 people in our church congregation. All of a sudden, those 20 people are diffusing back across the county um, and, and spreading that beyond just our congregation. And we know because this virus is hitting um, marginalized communities, um, immigrant and minority communities so much harder, I think it's there's also sort of a personal responsibility to make sure that we are not links in that chain. So as a group of folks who value social justice and inclusion and racial justice, it's important to make sure we are not contributing um, to, to those health disparity outcomes ourselves. So I'm gonna go back to some of the questions about kids and family life. Uh, and there's a question about whether or not kids should be wearing masks when they play outside. So you've talked about outside being safer than inside. If you've got two kids running on the beach, you know, not hugging each other, should they be wearing masks? Yeah, so some of that's going to depend on the age um, and, and temperament of the kids. So my daughter um, will be three next month, and sometimes she wears a mask, sometimes she doesn't. She's, it's hard to keep it on her. Um, sometimes we'll have her wear um, a little hat with a plastic visor. Um, she looks like an adorable beekeeper. And that's not great, right? Um, I would never suggest it for an adult unless they had like some severe sensory issues. Um, but at least it kind of minimizes the worst of the sneezing and coughing and licking. Um, I think if your kid is able to, and as they get older, eight, nine, 10, um, it's easier, then yeah, you know, if you can wear a mask, wear a mask. Um, for younger ones, it's important to think about sort of the amount of like fussing with their face that a mask might entail and what the risk trade-off is in that, so yeah. So that's a good sort of segue to another couple of questions that have come up about that um, contact, right? Um, mm -hmm. Surface to hand contact. Can you get the virus from say petting somebody's dog? You're going out on a walk in the fresh air and you, you pet someone's dog. Or another question came up about shared food. You know, if if you are, um, if there is a point where like there's a, a platter of cheese and crackers on a table and you're six feet apart, um, what's the risk factor in, in those sorts of activities? I think to the degree that you can avoid touching shared surfaces, do. Um, so I pet dogs because who can avoid petting a dog? Um, I think the ability of a virus to live in a dog's fur, like somebody would have had to like cough on the dog recently and then you'd have to pet the exact place that the dog, I don't know, I pet a dog. I also keep hand sanitizer in my purse and pockets at all times and my hands are ragged from like the alcohol and the hand washing, the alcohol and the hand sanitizer and the washing. Um, so you can't not touch things, but you can use hand sanitizer a lot. Um, as far as food goes, yeah, I think it is a good idea to try and use your own utensils as much as possible. Um, a shared cheese platter, everybody gets their own toothpick. If you're having a picnic in the park, people bring their own um, dishes. Um, and I think to, to the extent that those types of risk minimization things are possible, absolutely. And I have hand sanitizer everywhere, in my car, in my pocket, in my purse, it's just everywhere. I really appreciate you talking about risk minimization because this, this goes back to the we're human beings. And this is actually a really great connection somebody made between sexuality education and risk mitigation, right? Mm -hmm. So in our tradition, we value comprehensive, progressive, science-based sexuality education, which talks a lot about risk mitigation because we know abstinence almost never works with yeah. human beings, right? We yes. are not, we are not, you know, sort of binary 
creatures, we have this whole spectrum of behaviors. And so we've learned from other places in human behavior that talking about abstinence usually backfires because then once, you know, once you have shared that cheese plate, well, then all bets are off and you just kind of say, well, if I'm going to be unsafe, I'm going to be, uns you know, and so I really appreciate you talking about risk, these decisions about risk mitigation. It, nothing is 100% safe, but we choose based on our values, based on our own sense of personal risk. Um, and what we're comfortable with and that it's this and that it's not a, a binary about this is safe and this is not safe but rather it's degrees that then we that we navigate absolutely and you know i i my my research was mostly in hiv before this and i think there's just such a parallel abstinence only is is not going to work we need to think about harm reduction um and we need to think about harm reduction not only for ourselves, but because this is an airborne infectious disease, we need to think about harm reduction for other people because we're all at risk while the numbers are high for everybody. So I think about um, uh, if I want to get takeout, I try and prioritize, is this a place that has paid sick leave for their staff? Because A, the person making my food is less likely to get virus on it for me, and um, that person is less likely to infect the people that they work with. So there, it's that public health perspective on harm reduction as well, not just I'm okay, but this, how does this affect other people too? Yeah. Um, so there is one question about why is it that some people have the virus in their bodies but have little or no reaction or illness from it? Do we know anything about that? Nope. We don't know. It's such a good question. I think if we, <laughs> if only we knew, it's a wild virus. Um, so some people, we know that there's associations with underlying risk factors. Um, it looks as if um, the virus um, seems to do kind of two different things. One, it can sort of um, freak out our immune system to the point where it starts attacking um, um, our, all of our internal organs systemically. Um, and another is that it can cause kind of like blood clotting um, issues. And so that can lead to things like strokes and like toes that are blue and this kind of thing. So well, we're not really sure what the difference is. Um, it, there's some kind of social aspects in that people who already have um, cardiovascular issues who have like um, high blood pressure or something seem to be more at risk, but um, I don't know. It's a real good question. I wish we knew. So, so should, so this, this um, maybe relates to the question of whether or not everyone should be tested. Should we aim for just testing people or should we wait until people have a reason to be tested um, and meet criteria and what should those criteria be? Yeah. So when we think about public health, we tend to think of it at, at different levels that affect individual health. So there's you, the individual, there's sort of your family and the people you spend time with, um, and there's, there's the community that you spend your time in, and then there's all the kind of laws and policies, and all of those things are always at play. And one of the things that's at play with testing is in a perfect world where we didn't have supply shortages and there was enough of everything and you know everybody had healthcare, um, yes, <laughs> we know your status, know your status is, has been kind of the, the push in HIV for a number of years. And, and I, and I think it should absolutely be the push, um, for COVID-19 as well. Know your status and know the status of people that you spend time with. However, we have had issues with having enough tests and having access to enough tests. Um, which is absolutely a, a policy system level issue and sense of having enough for everybody we do need to make sure that people who really really do need access to a test can get one relatively relatively quickly so that they can um, protect themselves and protect the people around them so when there are shortages yeah don't just go get one because they're cur because you're curious when there are not shortages please go to town and get tested like once a week. That's great. Do you know sort of the status of where we are with testing supplies here in California right now? I know it changes seemingly daily. From what I've heard. Yeah, um, so I keep an eye on San Diego County and friends 
just kind of like report back to me when they get a test on how long it takes now. So in San Diego, turnaround time for a while was 10 to 14 days, which is just horrifying. Um, I think recently it's down to two or three days. Um, so I, I think as, as case numbers come down across the entire state and they're coming down in San Diego County in a way that kind of mirrors that, it's become a lot easier because fewer people are worried. Um, so there's less backup. Um, I wish, so our county kind of talks about um, sort of here's the triggers, here's the measures we're looking at to decide what's safe and what's not. And I think the state has similar guidelines. I don't know about Santa Barbara County. Um, I wish, you know, uh, time it takes to get a test. So waiting list to get a test and turnaround time to get your test results back. I wish those were two of the metrics because I think they are really important ones. So we're heading into the fall um, and the winter and the flu season. So one of the questions is, what is the, uh, what do you expect to be the interaction between the regular flu and COVID-19? Yeah, I'm not sure. So from, from an immunology perspective, I'm, I'm not quite sure how those two are going to mix. I can tell you that I know um, physicians are a little bit worried about what's going to happen in the hospital system, because we do always have some amount of people who are hospitalized. Um, who need intensive care as a result of the flu. Um, so what's going to happen when there are two infectious diseases floating around that can land people in the hospital or the ICU? Um, it's also possible, likely, that there is kind of a seasonality aspect to coronavirus, just like there is to cold and flu. So it's not clear if it's going to rebound as the temperatures kind of drop in the fall. Um, and if it is, to what degree? So I, I don't know about the biology of it, but I know the health system of it is definitely concerning. So one of the questions, again, thinking about monitoring health was about um, a pulse oxygen test, right? One of those little oxygen meters you put mm -hmm. on your finger. To, is that a useful daily practice? Um, the person who wrote in the question said, can they, they hear that it can give you data that a drop in oxygen can indicate um, that you're sick. Mm -hmm. So first, an interesting thing about um, pulse oximeters is they were developed, um, they, um, they put, you put it on your finger and it's like a little light and it measures sort of the oxygen in your blood. Um, and because of the way that it works and because of it was developed and tested with um, white volunteers, with white people, it doesn't work as well uh, for people of color, which is just a really interesting aspect of like, racism in medical design. So that's problematic. Um, setting that aside and assuming the person who asked and some of the folks who are interested in the answer are white. Um, in terms of something to just stick on your finger every day, I don't know, it's a fun toy like an Apple Watch, why not? Um, I will tell you that in a moment of like kind of like intense worry when the numbers were climbing quite a lot in San Diego and Ventura County where my parents live and my parents are both over 60. Um, I did actually buy an oximeter at Target and like have it shipped to them because what it can do is give you a sense of if you know that you have the virus. Hello, do you want to say hi? Hey, sister. Hi. So good to see you. So if you know that you have the virus, um, you can kind of use that to monitor your oxygen levels um, and, and know if you need to go seek further help. Because right now, unless you're very, very sick, the medical advice you're probably going to get is to just stay home and to go to the emergency room if you're short of breath. So if you are very worried, um, if you're high risk, maybe it's nice to have one on hand so you know at what point to go to the, to go to the uh, urgent care. But for day to day, I wouldn't worry. So one of the questions we have uh, is referencing something that Dr. Fauci, uh, our, our friend at the national level, um, said that he'd be happy if a vaccine was 50% effective or better 60 or 70%. If that's true, how safe will we be when a vaccine comes on the scene if we're looking at 50 to 70% effectiveness? Mm -hmm. So a good friend of mine, um, has worked in sort of the world of flu vaccines for many years, and she hates it when we mention this, but the flu vaccine is usually about 60% effective. You should still get it. Definitely this year, you should get your flu vaccine. Um, and I think in any degree of protection is gonna be great because 
the more people who it does work for, the fewer people who are going to be transmitting, right? So imagine that there's only half the people who are currently um, transmitting the virus are capable of transmitting the virus. That's already an enormous drop um, in, in sort of uh, public health problems. The other thing, and this is how the flu vaccine works, is there's some possibility that even if you do get the, um, you do get it, um, you're, um, you, you get less sick, um, even if you do get sick. So that's fabulous too. Um, yeah, the, I, I would take 60%, that'd be great. Um, in terms of safety, so vaccines have to go through kind of three phases. And I feel like we've all heard phase two, phase three now. Um, and, and none of those are being skipped at this point. So phase one is um, we, we, um, we injected this into some folks and like it was fine. Nobody fell over and like turned purple. Like there were no egregious side effects. This is safe. Um, the next step is we gave this to a set of folks. Um, we tried out some different doses and then we saw if they had a, an immune response and we saw kind of which dose people could handle. And that's what just happened with this Moderna vaccine that people were kind of excited about and that's going into the next phase. So they established with the Moderna vaccine that this kind of middle dose that they tried out, um, it, people's immune systems react to it and there aren't super bad adverse effects. Um, you might've heard a story about one person who got it and like ended up in urgent care and he was super ill. He got the highest, highest dose and that's not the one they're trialing. And then the last phase, well, and then the next phase before it goes into production, is you give it to a ton of people. So the Moderna vaccine is gonna be given to 30,000 people and they're all gonna be monitored. And, you, and it's mostly being, um, uh, they're signing up people who are considered high risk. So um, healthcare workers, um, minorities, which is gonna be a whole like thing, um, and other people who are kind of gonna run into the virus more than other people. And then half of them are gonna get a placebo, half aren't. And then you compare across those 30,000 people does it work? And have we had any adverse events? And after all of that, and after the FDA has kind of checked off every step, then we say, this is good to go to market. Um, and about half this team is um, academic scientists and half are Moderna. So the academic scientists, you know, they just want a vaccine to work. They have less financial gain than the other folks. So, yeah. Um, we have just a few more questions here, and hopefully we're going to be able to get through everybody's questions, and then we'll we'll close up in about um, eight or ten minutes here. But one of the questions was, um, how safe are medical procedures that are indoors and unmasked, like dentistry, dermatological skin exams, uh, those kinds of procedures? Mm -hmm. So I think these are all, again, thinking about... Um, uh, harm reduction and just knowing your level of risk. In individual cases, I think those are conversations that you need to have with a healthcare provider, um, what the risk is of not getting, getting or not getting this procedure. I will tell you that my own stuff, um, I have been being extra good about flossing because will I be going to my routine cleaning this year? Probably not. Um, would I get a root canal? I mean, yeah, that's different, right? Um, will I need to after not getting a cleaning for a year or two? I hope not. Um, so that that's always kind of my trade-off. Like, what is the consequence of delaying this for potentially six months or a year? Do not delay your child's vaccinations. Pediatricians' offices are all set up for this. We're actually really worried that there's going to be a generation of kids who, like, have delayed or didn't get their vaccination. So do not delay those. Go get those. If you didn't, go make your appointment right now. Super duper important. Um, but more routine things, <laughs> but get vaccinated. What about um, things like staying in a hotel motel that says it's adhering to the guidelines for prevention? Yeah. So in full transparency, it's been a long six months for me and I have a three-year-old and I totally booked a hotel room next week to go like be in a room by myself and read a book for 24 hours. Um, <laughs> Feel you. So, Feel I'm, you I'm, <laughs> so I'm doing it. Um, so I, you know, I, I feel like I have to 
say that. Um, the things that I think about in terms of hotel are first and foremost, the hotel staff. Um, I want to make sure that my patronizing a place or putting demands on a staff is not doing anything that would put people at risk. So um, when I when I signed in, I said, can you please make sure to open all the doors and windows if you can before I get there? I'm not going to like do anything like I'm not going to leave the room. I'm going to like hang out and read a book in the room. Um, I think there's like a restaurant on site outdoors. I hope I'm, I'm not going to go to that. So I am going to take measures to make sure other people are safe from me and that I'm not contributing to unsafe working conditions. And I'm going to tip exceedingly well, which you should absolutely do for everybody, especially the cleaning staff, um, if you do go to a hotel. So what I'm hearing you say kind of uh, uh, one of the refrains is that um, we're not just thinking or we shouldn't just be thinking about what is my risk, but in every every situation that prompts you to think what's my risk should also prompt a parallel thought. What is the risk to others if I ha am a carrier that any time that thought comes into your head. Is this a risky situation for me just get into kind of the practice of popping up that parallel question. What is the risk to others if I am contagious um, and and to, so that we can just get in the habit as you know, we kind of started off this conversation talking about all of these micro decisions that we're being asked to make um, and how exhausting that can be. But if we mm -hmm. just get in the habit of looking at those micro decisions, not just as based on your own individual risk factors, but what is the risk to the community um, and, and how do you mitigate both exposure and um, carrier um, status. Yeah. And not only if I am infectious, can somebody else get sick, but what am I asking other people to do by engaging in this behavior? So by going to a restaurant, am I asking a waitress to go in and out of a busy, hot, crowded kitchen and then walk between a lot of patrons multiple times? So even if I'm not infectious, I'm still asking somebody to engage in an action that could put them at risk. Um, and I, I try to avoid doing that type of thing too. So don't ask them for lots of refills and extra condiments and make them run back and forth to the back of the house, weaving their way through the whole thing 15 times if you're eating out at a table. Get takeout and go to a park. Santa Barbara is beautiful. So I do want to, um, I want to close with a, a question about the schools. You know, as a parent, um, I am looking very closely at what's happening with the schools. We're fully online here in Santa Barbara County uh, for the foreseeable future. School starts up in about two weeks. Still looking at, we're not sure what our schedules are gonna be, not sure when our kids' cohorts are gonna be morning or afternoon, or there's so many questions about schools. How do you feel about the conditions and what are the conditions um, that a school or community needs to have in place really before they could consider in-person classes to be safe? And we've got our, <laughs> our, our, our living, um, yep. breathing, uh, okay. personified. <laughs> There. Yeah, so in addition to having a kid in preschool, um, my mom taught elementary school for almost 30 years. Um, and so I think a lot about what I feel good about my mom being in a classroom right now. And she actually just retired. So fortunately, we don't have to think about it. So kids are a really big unanswered question. And I think until we know what's happening with younger kids, um, and, and disease transmission, um, it's really hard to make good choices. It's become increasingly clear that kids over the age of 10, 10, 12, probably transmit about the same as adults. Um, and so somebody put it as uh, kindergarten over college. Um, it's probably from, it's probably best to prioritize opening lower grades um, first and then kind of, you know, your senior year of high school last, which is just such a shame for seniors. Um, things I think about are ventilation, um, staffing. We know that the number, we know that the more people in a group, the faster the virus can spread. We know that a lot of people indoors is not a great idea. Um, I was feeling a little bit better about schools until a paper came out from the CDC last week about um, a summer camp in North Georgia 
where a bunch of kids went to a summer camp. Um, they had all had a negative test within 12 days of showing up, which we don't know what happened in the 12 days after they got that negative test result. Um, they did not wear masks and the doors and windows were not left open. And like George is real hot and humid in the summer. So you can imagine the AC was on. And there was lots of vigorous singing and chanting was the line in the paper. Uh, and half of the, and one person um, felt sick about two days in, they got their positive test result at four days, everybody was sent home. And within those four days, about half the camp of kids like 10 to se um, five to 17 were infected. And that, um, I was like, like you, I audibly gasped multiple times reading this paper. That was bad news for schools, I'm sorry to say. Um, and I think that schools do not necessarily hinge on the decisions of parents and superintendents and teachers. They hinge on the decisions of the, the community at large, right? Because while there are 500 cases right now, 300 cases a day in San Diego, it is not safe to open schools. If there are 20 cases a day and a, con and a case investigator can call up every single one of those 20 people within 24 hours, know exactly where they are, know exactly where all the people that they've been in contact with in the last two weeks are, if we know where all the virus is in the community, we can feel pretty good about sending our kids to school where hopefully it's not. If we don't know where it is, if we're having 200, 300, 500 cases a day, then that's not safe. And so I think there's been a lot of conversation about how do we put a plexiglass? Do we put the schools out in tents? Do we, do we feel good about, you know, our 65 year old teacher teaching third graders? Those are some friends. Um, but I, I think it's been a real, um, it, <laughs> those are some friends, that's Reverend Julia. But I think what we really need to think about is what's going on outside the schools and how do we get the numbers down in the rest of the community so that everybody else can go to school safely. Um, and I had something else, but I lost my train of thought. Oh, and she goes to preschool. Her preschool is entirely outdoors. She is outside all day long. Um, and I feel good about that choice. And I, um, we actually took her out of a daycare that would have been inside a gym because I did not feel good about that choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here we are in Southern California. Um, and so the outdoors are a huge gift that we can use. Um, you know, year round. So this isn't yeah. even just a temporary thing where I talk to my friends in Massachusetts who are looking at the winter time. Yeah. Um, so we have reached the end of our hour and um, Esther has been extraordinarily patient in allowing us to have you with us. Hi, Brian. Um, and I am so grateful for the gift of your time um, and also the gift of your expertise and your attention um, and your heart in this work. It's not, you know, there's a lot of data, um, a lot of detail, a lot of unknowns. And I just appreciate the way that you can articulate the intersectionality and keep reminding us over and over again that while we're making individual decisions, we are also um, required to keep an eye on questions of justice, on questions of access and equity to healthcare, um, and the ways that this is exposing the systems that undergird our society, um, and that we have a responsibility not just for our own health, but to our collective health. Um, and it's people like you who help us keep our eyes on that bigger picture. So thank you so much for joining us. And I wanted to, in that vein, I wanted to close with a quote that you shared with us, which I've heard before and is a fabulous quote. It's by uh, Lila Watson, who is an indigenous Australian activist, uh, an amazing woman. And she says, if you have come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. So friends near and far, let us work together because our liberation is bound up together. And none of us are healthy until all of us are healthy. So thank you so much for joining us. Thanks to all of you who joined us. If you have any more questions, you know, you can get in touch with us and, and maybe we can do some follow-up if we missed anything. Is there, do you have any final words before we say goodnight? I have nothing that can top that. So. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Take care, stay safe, take care of each other, and we'll see you online at some point in the future. <laughs>